Hello, this is Miss Kyler, and I'm going to be telling you about the epic Beowulf. I'm not going to be going over the whole thing, but I'm going to be pointing out some key passages. What I recommend is that you print off or have on your screen also, while you listen to the lecture, the um, excerpts from Beowulf that I have provided. And then I want you to mark up or highlight or take notes as you listen to the lecture. So first of all, when we look at Beowulf, we think about it's an epic. So what is an epic? Here are the criteria. First of all, it is a long narrative about a serious or worthy traditional subject. So long needs to be long. It needs to be about a serious traditional subject. Okay. Its diction is elevated in style. It employs formal, dignified, objective tone and may, many figures of speech. Okay. So it's very elevated in style. The narrative focuses on the exploits of a hero or demigod who represents the cultural values of a race, nation, or religious group. It's not about a common person. It's about some big, huge god or king or big supernatural hero. The hero's success or failure will determine the fate of that people or nation. The action takes place in vast setting and covers a wide geographic area. The setting is frequently sometime in the remote past. The action contains superhuman feats of strength or military prowess. Gods or supernatural beings frequently take part in the action to affect the outcome. And the narrative starts in, in medias res, and that's an important word, so take a note of it, in the middle of the action. So it means that the earlier events leading up to the start of the poem will be recounted in the character's narratives or in flashbacks. In Beowulf, we're going to go look back on what he, his days of yore, things that happened before Beowulf, and come back to how they are related to what's happening with Grendel. Okay, so the opening of Beowulf starts out with the word so. Some transition, translations start with what, or listen, or lo. This is um, Seamus Haney's translation, and I like it. It's a lot. It's very poetic, has a lot of the same, and keep, keeps the same style of the Anglo-Saxon, Old English, um, original language. But it opens with the word so, which is tr the, from the Anglo-Saxon word what. W-H-A-E-T. It just means listen, pay attention. It's used to grab the reader's attention at the many, beginning of many Anglo-Saxon narratives. And in the beginning, we talk about the history of the nations involved in this epic, the Danes and the Swedes. Okay, So what we're talking about is not the Anglo-Saxons, but their Viking ancestors. That, you know, This is before they came to Britain. This is when they're in Denmark and Sweden. Okay. Now here, you also pay attention throughout the whole thing, they have these kennings. Now kenning is a compound word that's like a riddle, like a whale road. What is a road that a whale swims on? And that means an ocean or a sea, right? So instead of saying ocean, they use this poetical compound whale road. Okay, we see that, we'll see a few more as we go along. If you see any other ones that I don't highlight, make sure you pay attention to those and also mark them in your um, excerpts. Also, at the very end of this passage here, um, around line 10, it ends with, that was one good king. So we see that this happened a lot, as the preceding lines describe a violent warrior who had defeated his po foes sorry, and subjected them to pay tribute. So many long passages in Beowulf end with a short and simple one-line summary that tells the audience what they should think or feel, like, that was one good king. So in this case, we can look back and see how the Vikings and Anglo-Saxons would define a good king. A good king is someone who has power, he's strong, he, takes, he makes people pay tribute, he's able to maintain his authority. Now here's another typical device, it's an appositive. Okay, so very often in epics we have a series of appositives, which is, look at this, afterwards a boy child was born to shield a cub in the yard, a comfort sent by God to that nation. So this is this boy child, and the boy child is also a cub in the yard, a comfort sent by God to the nation. These are noun phrases that follow a noun phrase and basically redefine that noun. Boy child is also a club, cub in the yard, also a comfort sent. Okay, so these are called appositives. And you'll notice that some points in the narrative talks about fate, 
and sometimes the gods and warriors. And these are from the Viking pagan traditions. Remember, this whole Beowulf is actually from an oral narrative that is about the Vikings. But at other times when the narrative talks about God and stories from the Bible. Okay, so the people that were transcribing the epic from the oral tradition to the written word were monks. And these monks felt inspired to insert Christian beliefs into the otherwise pagan tale. They didn't feel it was right for them to just write this pagan tale without also using it as a preaching tool. So Britain had begun to be Christianized in 500 AD, and most parchments of the written text of Beowulf date from 700 to 1000 AD. Remember, the spoken text, the oral tradition, was much older. Okay. Um, also, in many places we find that Beowulf is, is a prescription. The epic is a prescription of what a good warrior, a good leader should be. So when you read these passages carefully, you can see what characteristics a good warrior should be based on Anglo-Saxon standards. You can actually start writing a list. You must be prudent, you must give freely, you must be generous, you must be strong, so forth. Also, um, we see this part where he talks about steadfast companions will stand by him and hold the line. So if you're a good leader, you have steadfast companions. And this reflects the concept of comitatus. So you want to look at that term, make sure you look at these glossary terms in the definitions I've provided. But a comitatus, it has, part of that is the concept that a good leader is brave and generous and the brotherhood of warriors stands together to defend their leader. Okay. Also notice that although there is no real concept of self in the Anglo-Saxon society, the goal is for a warrior to show forth himself as courageous and loyal. The very brave heroes will be granted a seat in Valhalla among the brotherhood of immortal warriors at an eternal feast with their gods and goddesses. Also by being brave, they are necessary to the continuation of the nation and make the entire nation strong. So there's always this idea of if you do what is right for your nation, you will be rewarded. Uh, behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. So this is an uh, example of alliteration. So alliteration is the repeating of the initial consonant words in a close proximity. And this helps poets to memorize a long narrative, because having does that repetition. Um, Anglo-Saxon literature love to use <clears throat> alliteration and assonance. Assonance is the repetition of the vowel sounds. And alliteration is the consonant sounds. Okay. So here, you know, just a long passage, but I want to draw your attention to the word ring giver. And that's another kenning. A kenning is a good leader. Um, ring giver is a good leader. One who is generous to his thanes. He will provide them with treasure and supplies, reward their loyalty, and show he is able to protect and care for them. This is an important component of comitatus. So ring giver, who is a king that is generous enough to give, give out rings, is a king. So ring giver is a king. And all of this part is, um, all this description of a typical Viking burial. The warrior is laid in the boat along with his treasures and set out to sea, going off to his afterlife. So we kind of see the contrast that a Viking is supposed to be someone out at sea, adventurous, brave, going out and pursuing um, dangers and fighting off evil. Um, here is, there's a little point. We're talking about um, Hrothgar where he's starting to build Hararot. And it's interesting that in contrast to what the Viking tradition is, he's actually putting down roots. He's building this huge mead hall that he wants to be around for years and years to come and be the, you know, the greatest um, mead hall ever to be. As his friends and kinsmen flock to his ranks, so when you're a good king and you have ability to provide and protect someone, you're going to have followers. That's part of, again, comitatus. It's interesting that once the Viking hero's mind turned to the hall building, instead of sea faring, his trouble begins. So Vikings are supposed to be wanderers and adventurers, not land dwellers. So he's a generous king, but perhaps his pride in his meat hall symbolizes his trust in his own power rather than trusting in the supernatural. We see that a lot, trusting in man-made um, items rather than in spiritual or supernatural items. Um, Hararot is Anglo-Saxon for hall of the heart, and the heart is a male deer. Um, the people have a sense of false security in their meat hall, which will not last long. 
So here we have a bit of foreshadowing. It says, but in time it would come, the killer instinct unleashed among in-laws, the bloodlust rampant. Okay, so don't, don't get too comfortable, people. And then Grendel attacks Herod. So Grendel is a monster. He's described as a monster. He's often referred to as a demon. He is exiled, banished from society. He nursed a hard grievance. So it's interesting to think about the story, the way it's written, you know, from the, the point of view that it is about um, Beowulf, but also about Grendel being the monster and the horrible fiend, but also think about it from Grendel's point of view just a little bit. It's interesting to think, okay, he nursed a hard grievance. What happened? What did they do to him that made him bear this grudge? After all, he comes out to get them. They come back to get him. It goes back and forth. Um, there's no really um, end to the cycle of revenge throughout this um, epic. He hates to hear them socialize since he is an outcast and cannot partake of their happiness. He's no longer part of that comatatus. And so remember, exile is worse than death in Anglo-Saxon and Viking society. Um, they do mention the clear song of a skilled poet. Remember the word scop. Scop is someone who relays long narratives and stories and sings the songs like a minstrel in the court. So times were pleasant for the people there until finally one, a fiend out of hell, began to work his evil in the world. So again, we're describing him as a fiend out of hell. So I want you to look at all the descriptions of Grendel and think about what you imagine him like. And based on the descriptions they give us, I know I have my own um, picture in my mind, and I don't want to put that into your head, but I definitely do not see um, Grendel looking like a human in the way he's described. There's no way you can imagine him like a, a, a human-shaped thing. In the cartoon that you see that I've included in the lesson, um, he's actually shown as some kind of shadowy, morphing creature that's kind of fluid. And I think that's basically to allow you to retain your own picture of Grendel and his mother. Uh, Grendel is an exile descended from Cain. Here we see the insertion of the biblical accounts. This is used to describe the Viking concept of man price. If a warrior kills another lord's warrior or kin, he must pay a price in gold or wealth equal to the value of that warrior, or pay with his own life with death or exile. So Grendel is still paying the price of Cain's earlier deed of killing Abel. So that is part of why he's holding in that grievance. Also look at all the alliteration. You're going to see us throughout the whole thing because they just love the alliteration and Seamus Haney does a great job of retaining that. Grendel, Grimm. Now haunting and marauding, that's assonance. We're repeating the um, vowel sound. Misery among monsters. So it's the initial sound, the initial of the stressed syllable. Cain's clan, creator, condemned outcasts, all that repeated C sound, that's alliteration. So as we go, keep looking for alliteration and assonance. It's going to come all over the place. Now, in the Bible, it speaks of the mark of Cain, and here it is claimed that the mark led to his offspring being monstrous beings. So all the bad, all the evil creatures, all the monsters that are in the world all came because of Cain, according to this um, legend here. So he says, so after nightfall, all Grendel set out for the lofty house. And here we see Grendel is like the nightmare. He's a creature of the night. Nighttime is when all the bad things creep out, right? They don't like the daylight. They get afraid of that. Kind of a, that juxtaposition, that comparison of heaven and hell, dark and light. That we have our archetypal, archetypical um, comparison. Case more more alliteration. I love it. Grim and greedy, he grabbed 30 men. So if he's grabbing 30 men in one swipe, he, this is no human-sized monster. He's got to be huge. Um, if you really want to see what I imagine, go ahead and Google images. Um, Rancor from Return of the Jedi. That's what I imagine. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. It's a long time ago, back in the old days. But whenever I read this, I always imagine the Rancor from Return of the Jedi. Um, and here, they, again, they talk about the death price, which is the Wehrgeld, which is the man price, the price in blood or money that must be paid to make reparation for any evil deeds. 
again, another canning, death shadow. They describe Grendel as a death shadow. What is a shadow that pursues death? Grendel. Okay, so after the destruction, Grendel tears the place apart and kills a lot of people. Um, there, Hrothgar, the lord of Herat, is left humiliated by the loss of his guard. Um, it's more significant as the fact that if Hrothgar cannot protect his thanes in his own mead hall, he loses his power, strength, and the loyalty of his men. He becomes nothing. He can't provide for society. Remember in Anglo-Saxon and, and Viking society, if you can't do your bit, then you're nothing. You don't exist. Um, so again, we have this part where they're talking about, they're trying to figure out what to do about Grendels. They're doing all of this, um, all these pagan rituals. And here the monks who transcribed the epic onto parchment explained the pagan deeds of their ancestors, but they bemoaned the fact that they were in ignorance of Christianity. It's like they said, oh dear, you know, and think about it, what... These were people, the Vikings, that um, were born in paganism. They did not have exposure to Christianity. And yet now you're looking back, now that this society has been Christianized, they're looking back and saying, but what about our ancestors? What's become of them? They did not have the light. And it's kind of that, that sort of that frustration that they can't go back in time and be missionaries to their own ancestors and tell them, no, 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 this is the way, don't do those things. Um, so enter Beowulf. So Beowulf hears about Grendel, and he decides he's going to do something about it. They call him Higelax Thane. Uh, so Higelax Thane, he is, you know, the, 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 the he serves Higelax. He's a typical epic, epic hero. He's got superhuman powers, and he is of noble birth. He says he's highborn and powerful, and he's the mightiest man on earth. Um, Beowulf comes and announces himself to Rothgor's troops, and it says he unlocks his word hoard. When a word hoard is another canning, it means speech. So the idea is that you've hoarded all these words, you've memorized all these words, and now they're pouring forth. And here he introduces himself and his band of 14 warriors volunteering to help Rothgar fight against Grendel. And now when he's saying to them all this is my, my awesome strength and my I'm so brave and strong, it sounds like he's being egotistic and a lot of people point their finger at him and laugh at Beowulf saying he's being egotistic. But actually what he's really doing is just providing his credentials and reassuring Rothgar. If he went there and said, well, I don't know if I can or not. I'm just kind of little old me. Uh, who's going to feel safe and secure. He has to present himself as strong, undaunted, and he also has to be able to, you know, defeat Grendel, right? He has to be able to do it. Um, now, one thing we see is that Beowulf says he will do battle without the use of man-made weapons. As we proceed, we'll see how the use of man-made weapons is often his downfall. It's his fatal flaw. Whenever he relies on things made by man, He's going to fail. So hand to hand, the idea is he relies on divine strength, his superhuman powers. Um, with weapons, he is depending on the comparative weakness of mortals. And here he says, whichever one death fells must deem it a just judgment by God. This is a common form of trial in the Anglo-Saxon days, trial by mortal combat, in which the survivor will be deemed innocent, a dead man deemed the guilty party. So if you were weak and you were killed, automatically you were guilty so fate goes ever as fate must reference to the viking belief in fate rather than in god's intervention so we see how those that evolution of fate came into the idea of mortal combat and they actually inserted the idea of god into that um traditional belief from where he crouched at the king's feet unfirth a son of eglaf's spoke contrary words so here, Unferth, a new character, probably Hrothgar's favorite since he's crouched at the king's feet, feet, right? And right now he taunts Beowulf, doubting the rumors of his strength, tries to poison Hrothgar against Beowulf. So he's jealous of Beowulf. And later Beowulf comes back to him and says, well, friend Unferth, you have had your say about Breca and me, but it was mostly beer that was doing the talking. He's like, nah, you're drunk. And Beowulf defends his honor and comes back at Unferth with accusations that Unferth himself has killed members of his own family and has failed to defend Herod. So he's like, and Unferth, you're not one to be talking. 
And there's a little ex, you know, little snippet here that tells you what happened, the parts that's left out of these expert excerpts. And then that's there's a whole description about Wealthiel. And Wealthiel is Hrothgar's wife. She comes in just like any wife of a lord would do and serves the mead. That's the ale in the big cup. And she serves it to each of the wars. They all drink from the cup as a sign of unis unifying the forces. And a lot, oftentimes there's this kenning that's used to, for a wife of a lord as peace weaver. She's the one that weaves the peace. She goes among the warriors, brings the mead, and makes sure everybody's calm, sensible, and united. Then out of the night came the shadow stalker. Here comes Grendel again. Um, I like this little description. I'm going to just pinpoint some of these descriptive phrases. While a baleful light flame more than light flared from his eyes. I like that because he's like a glowy eyed monster. Again, he really described him as this really creepy thing. But his fate that night was due to change. His days of ravening had come to an end. So even before the battle gets, gets full force, we have some foreshadowing that he's not going to survive. So venturing closer, his talon was raised to attack Beowulf. So after gorging on one warrior, Grendel raises his talon to attack Beowulf. So he's, you know, he has these talons, he's clawed, he's an animalistic monster in this description. The captain of evil discovered himself in a hand grip harder than anything he had ever encountered in any man on the face of the earth. So it's like, ah, what's this? Beowulf, he's strong, help! And again, we see the Comitatus at work with his loyal thanes defending their lord. Now, no man-made weapon can kill Grendel. So only Beowulf's superhuman strength. So Beowulf yanks Grendel's arm out of its socket with his hands. And then later mm -hmm. hangs the monster's arm on the wall as a trophy of his victory. And that's the man price, right? The arm, paying the price of all the warriors he's killed. And later on, of course... Not only do we have Grendel, but we have Grendel's mother. So what's worse than a monster is a monster's mother. You know, the, the revenging mother. I love this passage. I'm going to read it because it's one of my favorite. A few miles from here, a frost-stiffened wood waits and keeps watch above a mirror. The overhanging bank is a maze of tree roots mirrored in its surface. At night, there, something uncanny happens. The water burns. And the mere bottom has never been sounded by the sons of men. On its bank, the heather stop stepper halts. The heart and flight from pursuing hounds will turn to face them, the hounds, with firm set horns and die in the wood rather than die beneath its surface. That is no good place. So here, this is a description of Grendel's mother's dwelling. And it's one of the most eerie descriptions in this epic. This whole thing is that there's a, such a creepy, creepy mirror that the deer, when it's being pursued, would rather stop and face its pursuers rather than even touch the surface of that horrible, creepy swamp. Of course, Beowulf also decides he'll go and help save the day with Grendel's Grind mother also. We see this theme of revenge running through the epic. They get him, they go back and get her, and so forth and so forth. A warrior's only legacy, only fulfillment of purpose and destiny is to have done deeds that have saved his countrymen. He's done that, not done that. He's nothing, just like a farmer who doesn't farm does nothing. Later, Unferth, at last acknowledging Beowulf as his better, gives Beowulf his own sword to use against Grendel's mother as a gesture of friendship. Of course, the sword will prove useless as we see on. But Beowulf dives into the burning fen, the swampy mire in which dwells Grendel's mother. And he's underwater for many hours. Seems to be someone who can breathe underwater. Talk about superhuman. And then Grendel's mother comes in, and again, this is no human female they're describing. She is a monster with talons, a werewolf like monster. Call her a wolfish swimmer. And again, he's trying to, you know, get her, but his man-made weapon fails. Beowulf. So I have my little comment there. Thanks for nothing, Unferth. Um, so as the hero observed that swamp thing from hell, hell, the tarn hag in all her terrible strength. I love that description. Really creepy. 
describing Grendel's mother as a thing and a hag, a swamp thing. That's so cool. And then, of course, he's trying to fight her, but the shinning blade refused to bite. Which Beowulf stopped trying to use those man-made weapons. Um, again, the theme of vengeance continues. It says, now she would avenge her only child, which is Grendel, right? It's interesting to think about how um, we never know who the father of Grendel is. So that may, that adds to the sense of him being un unhuman, right? While no man-made weapon will succeed, this weapon, from the made by the ancient giants, will defeat the swamp thing. So Beowulf kills Grendel's mother, finds Grendel's corpse, and takes Grendel's head as the man price for the warriors. It's Grendel and his mother have slain. And then at the end, there's the last part. So there's the three parts in this um, epic. There's the Grendel, there is Grendel's mother, and then there's the dragon. Three monsters that Beowulf has to fight his three trials. And really, the, th the two, Grendel and Grendel's mother, are preparation is training for what he really has to do he's really supposed to be a king that defends the people from this dragon that's attacking so having proven his courage and worth he reigns as a good king now he's old and until one began to dominate the dark a dragon on the prowl from the form from the steep vaults of the stone roof barrow where he guarded a horde, there was a hidden passage unknown to men, but someone managed to enter by it and interfere with a he heathen trove. He had handled and removed a gem-studded goblet. It gained him nothing, though with a thief's wiles he had outwitted the sleeping dragon that drove him into a rage, as the people of the country would soon discover. So the dragon awakes when a thief sneaks into his lair and steals a goblet. The dragon rav ravages the land and reveals. Beowulf vows to defeat the dragon, not wanting to take a weapon, but relenting, he takes a weapon. Not a good idea. All Beowulf's men defeat, desert him when they hear the howls of the dragon inside the cave, which is interesting because that's totally against Comatatus. And only one, Wiglaf, a young warrior, remains bravely with his leader. And Nagling the sword snapped. Again, man made weapons fail Beowulf, but Wiglaf. Weakens the dragon by dealing it a fatal blow in the belly, and then Beowulf is able to finish off the foe. Beowulf dies from his wounds. He is buried like a great warrior and is remembered forever as a good leader and ruler, and Wiglaf is named his heir, because Beowulf has no sons of his own. Which is very interesting. You know, think about he has no sons, and, Gre and Grendel had no father. Kind of an interesting idea, just to pursue that thought. So go back and listen, look at the key points, listen to the key points, and make sure you take notes of that before you proceed with the next assignment. Thank you. Bye.